In the mid-2000s, Hyundai had a problem that they were unable to prove with data. The brand wasn't cool. The company's US sales figures were decent, tucked below Japan's Big 3 and above Kia, Infiniti, and Acura. But the brand lacked the enthusiast loyalty they believed could take their reputation to the next level. Hyundai USA turned their gaze to the attainable sports car market. The major players had much in common. Two doors, around 300 horsepower, and most importantly, rear wheel drive. Hyundai decided their best bet to capture the enthusiast market would be to build a car like this of their own. They did, and it failed. But it also shaped the Hyundai we know today, which recently became the fifth largest automaker in the world, and gained some clout in the process. So how did Hyundai get cool? Are they cool? Let's find out. Check out Donut's new badass We Buy Junk Car shirt. Get it in this nice black and yellow, or this luxurious white and warm red. Mmm. Plus, if you order right now, we're gonna include these. Limited edition We Buy Junk Cars business cards, so you can help spread the word. Junk. And unlike these junk cars, this shirt is quality that lasts at the low price of $29.98, which is much cheaper than buying one of these used junk cars. Yeah, that's a great piece of junk. <laughs> so go to donutmedia.com to pick up your junk car shirt today. This thing is sick. Hyundai's reputation depends on who you talk to, and we'll get to that later. But when they first arrived in America, people all felt pretty much the same. In the mid 80s, the American market for hyper economy cars was becoming underserved. While manufacturers like Honda and Nissan began their stories selling bare bones economy cars for frugal drivers, they eventually positioned themselves up market to compete directly with more luxurious American car makers. This left a sizable opening in the market for smaller manufacturers from countries not usually included in the conversation, like Yugo from Yugoslavia and Korean newcomer Hyundai. Hyundai's first car in America arrived in 1986. The somewhat ironically named Excel made nearly 70 horsepower and that's kind of the only interesting thing about it. Underneath the exterior designed by industry legend Giorgetto Giugiaro, the Excel shared its architecture with the Mitsubishi Mirage, another Econo box. So far, the Excel sounds exceedingly mundane, but Hyundai had a pretty big trick up their sleeve. In 1986, the Excel cost $4,995, a little less than 13,000 in today's money. So sure, the vinyl interior felt a bit cheap, zero to 60 took over 16 seconds and a tachometer wasn't standard. But when you're paying that little for a car, people were more than willing to overlook those issues. And boy, did they. In Hyundai's first year in America, they sold over 168,000 cars in the US alone and 1 million worldwide. When taking a look at first year sales of other foreign manufacturers, Hyundai did pretty damn well. And look, People who bought these cars knew what they were getting into. The Excel's price was half of the new car average at the time. You could feasibly buy two of these for the price of one, an idea Hyundai actually used in their ad copy. So while paying customers accepted the shortcomings of a cheap car and loved them for it, people who didn't drive an Excel only saw it as a cheap car with zero features, thus beginning Hyundai's two-pronged reputation which would persist for decades. Even though initial sales for Hyundai were strong, it didn't take long before the company would sense that something was amiss. Two years in the US, and they already knew that people didn't think very highly of the brand. The eight ladies in early 90s were prime time for hot hatches like the Golf GTI and Honda CRX, cars built for young drivers who wanted something fun, but affordable. Hyundai said, hey, we've got something affordable. All we gotta do is make it fun. Then the kids will think we're cool, right? Did they succeed? Hyundai introduced the Scoop in 1988. This two-door four-seater wasn't a hatchback like the CRX, but it was sporty looking, and looks were maybe the only sporty thing about it. Underneath the pointy body was that same Excel chassis and asthmatic engine. There was also a turbo version, but it was also kind of slow from what I can tell. Now, that's not to say that Hyundai didn't try with the Scoop, because when it came to the suspension, Hyundai went over to jolly old England and asked Lotus to help them out with the handling. The result was what Motor Week called fun in their 1991 review. That was a win for Hyundai. They knew what their reputation was. They were upfront about it. Unfortunately for the scoop, Motor Week also pointed out that while the Honda CRX was $1,000 more than the Hyundai, the CRX had more power, handled better, and got better fuel mileage. So after seven short years of life, the scoop got the boot. Hyundai's quest for cool 
had hit a speed bump. Hyundai's follow-up to the Scoop wasn't far behind. Instead of reusing an old platform they didn't design, Hyundai went with a brand new car, named after my favorite animal class, Chondrichthys. Con... Chondrichthys? Con Chondrichthys. 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 <laughs> I'm talking about sharks, baby. Do you know what they call sharks in Spanish? Tiburon. Like the pursuit of the GTI and CRX, the Tiburon targeted the new hotness in attainable sports cars, front wheel drive sports coupes. Your Celicas, your Eclipses, your Preludes. It was super apparent Hyundai was going after this audience. The first gen Tiburon was basically a great value sixth gen Celica. Can I be vulnerable for a second? I kind of like this one. <laughs> There's something endearing in its ugliness. It's, it, it's like a pug. Yeah, you're ugly, but you're also so cute. You make loud noises. The styling got a little better with the second gen Tib. Remember earlier when I said Hyundai had a two-pronged reputation where Hyundai owners loved their cars and people who didn't thought they were junk? Well, this was especially true with the Tiburon. Go into any comment section on content about these cars and you'll be seeing people singing their praises all day. The Tib was reliable, and apparently the 2.7 liter V6 could take a ton of abuse. Even Richard Hammond had this to say about the Hyundai Coupe on Top Gear. It's just a good drive. Fact. People love their Tiburons. They might be at the same level as Crown Vic owners in their devotion. Even though the Tib had a faithful following, I don't really think it succeeded in being cool. It came out in a time when Hyundai still had a reputation for being cheap and the Tiburon was positioned as an entry level car in the sports coupe market, a market that was already seen as entry level. If the Celica was the first step into the sports car staircase, the Tib was that small half step you stub your toe on. It was there, but it's just easier to raise your leg a little higher. Cool attempt number three came in the mid 2000s. The Xbox 360 had just launched, smartphones weren't really a thing yet, uh, the Great Recession was just booming in the distance, menacingly. Times were good, but Hyundai still hadn't made a cool car. That was gonna change. You know, maybe they were looking at things wrong this whole time. It's really hard for any company to make a cool subcompact, so of course the Scoop didn't work. It's really hard to design an iconic front wheel drive sports coupe, so the Tiburon could be forgiven. Maybe they should have just made a car in a class that was inherently cool. I'm talking about rear wheel sports cars. Hyundai took a long look at the cars young buyers really wanted. The 350Z, S2000, Infiniti G37. If they could just build something like that, maybe things would be different this time around. What they came up with was the 2010 Genesis Coupe. This thing checked all the boxes. Rear wheel drive, independent rear suspension, two door, multiple engine choices, including a turbocharged option, manual transmission, and affordable. If you put all those attributes together in a car today, it would be a banger. Let's talk about the positives first. Both the naturally aspirated 3.8 liter V6 and the turbocharged two liter are solid engines. The lore around these power plants is that the cheaper turbo four banger was intended for the tuner crowd, a more affordable car that could be customized to the owner's preference. In fact, the two liter can be tuned with some bolt-ons to make around the same power as the V6. But with extensive engine work and a bigger turbo, the small Theta can make over 500 wheel horsepower. That's Pretty impressive. This is a total digression, but sometimes you'll hear a Genesis owner joke that their car is a rear wheel drive Evo. Here's what they mean. Honda's Theta four cylinder engine was designed with the cooperation of the Global Engine Manufacturing Alliance, a consortium between Chrysler, Hyundai, and Mitsubishi. Engines designed in this alliance use similar components and geometries, but they're not really the same. According to this blog post from Pavel Racing Engines, the two engines look similar on the outside, but the only aftermarket parts they can share are some head bolt studs and a head gasket. It's not exactly a carbon copy. So, sorry, Tanner. As for the larger 3.8 liter Lambda V6, that was for someone who wanted to drive the car as it came from the factory. It can also handle nitrous pretty reliably, and from what I've read, that's the best way to make power with this engine. Hyundai was really going after the hearts and minds of car nerds with the Genesis Coupe. Throughout its life, the car was offered with performance upgrades, including a top trim level called Track Edition, which featured beefed up suspension and Brembo brakes. But despite building a legit sports car that even car and driver loved in their review, Hyundai still adhered to their thrifty roots. A top trim track edition V6 coupe costs $375 less than a base level Nissan 370Z. But was it cool? Mm. It's, it's really hard to say. It's like 
a reverse Tiburone situation here. The drivetrain was good, the car handled well enough, I just don't think the styling was there. Look at the first and second gen cars and put them next to the competition. Nissan was bringing the heat in those days and the Genesis kind of looks like a car. I'm sorry to say, it's just not, it's just not cool looking. So Hyundai tried three times and it didn't really work out. But as Thomas Edison famously quipped when asked about his failures when inventing the light bulb, I've not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't make a sports car. With that spirit in mind, Hyundai persisted. Right before the Genesis Coupe's death in 2016, Hyundai made one of the best decisions in company history. Albert Bierman was fresh out of school when he was hired by BMW in the early 80s to work on the E30 road car. Albert's area of expertise was chassis engineering. Albert was a racing fanatic, but company tradition dictated that only senior engineers were allowed to work on race cars. However, the experienced engineers that would have normally taken that job were heavily focused on road car development. So somehow, Albert was able to get a spot on the race team. Albert's biggest contribution to the project was his roll cage. His steel design made the E30 twice as stiff as the old 635 racer, but Albert's cage was seven pounds lighter. Fast forward to 2008 and Albert became the vice president of BMW's M division. If there's an M car from the mid 2000s onward that you like, Albert played a big role in making it cool. This guy knows his sh which is why the car world was thrown off its racing line when Hyundai hired Albert in 2014. Officially, Bierman was hired as Hyundai's head of vehicle test and high performance division. Albert's first task was sorting out the upcoming G90 executive sedan. But what Hyundai really brought the German to Seoul to do was to build some badass cars. Hyundai was in the preliminary stages of establishing their own performance brand, much like the M division Bierman had just left. They called their skunk works N for Namyang or Nürburgring, depending on who you ask. Namyang is Hyundai's proving ground where the N Division is based, and they also have a research center at the ring, so it works both ways. To date, N Division has cranked out six cars, with three of them available in the US. Over here, we get the Veloster N, the Elantra N, and the Kona N. Over in Europe, they have the 120, 130, and 130N hatchback. The N cars are powered by two engines. The i20N subcompact features a 1.6 liter turbocharged four banger. Hyundai claims that the i20N weighs the same as their WRC championship rally car. That's pretty sick. I would very much like to drive one. The rest of N's lineup is powered by a 275 horsepower two liter engine. And um, these cars freaking slap, dude. <laughs> Albert Bierman was the special sauce Hyundai needed to turn their okay sports cars into legitimate sports cars. Turns out when you hire a guy who's been building some of the best cars in the world for 30 years, he's gonna build you a good car. But the question remains, are these end cars cool? That's a hard question to answer. Over the course of writing this episode, I realized I didn't really know how I was gonna end it. The problem is that cool is entirely subjective. What I think is cool might be entirely different than what you think is cool. The nature of cool itself is extremely fickle. If you try to be cool, you're not gonna be cool. Think about streetwear. A brand that's cool one week can be whack the next. And conversely, things that were once dorky can become cool in time. Hyundai, Maybe they weren't trying to build cool cars, they were just trying to build good cars. And if publications like Road and & Track and Motor Trend or any number of serious car people are to be trusted, the Veloster N is a really, really good car. It took 34 years, but Hyundai finally produced one of the best budget sports cars in the world. That's pretty cool. So where do they go from here? Late last year, Hyundai announced that Albert Bierman would be leaving his role as the leader of the N Division. He'll be around to advise Hyundai, but he's no longer at the helm. It's a little sad, but the N Division has some pretty sweet stuff in the works, like a mid-engine hatchback that we should be seeing around 2024 really looking forward to that. It's also very likely that the Ionic 5 EV will get the end treatment, which also has potential to be sick. But I think the biggest key to Hyundai's enthusiast loyalty can't come from Hyundai at all. In my research, something interesting kept popping up in YouTube comments and forum posts. Hyundai owners love their rides, but a common thread between older Hyundai sports cars 
is that performance almost always plateaued because of the lack of an aftermarket. People bought their scoops and Tiburons and Genesis Coupes, then didn't have a whole lot of stuff to bolt on when they wanted more out of them. Contrast that with the 350Z or WRX, which have an enormous amount of aftermarket support. Luckily, the tide seems to be shifting with the Veloster N. You can get suspension and big brake kits, granted from a small number of vendors, but it's getting better. To their credit, Hyundai has partnered with shops like BC Moto to show what you can do with their cars in an attempt to stoke the coals of the aftermarket, using a big old bellow to blow the air on those coals. Partnerships like that are key to get car nerds interested as crazy builds get more press. Hyundai finally found their way to cool with performance. This current crop of N cars have made huge headway in persuading people to join Team Hyundai. On my Instagram, Nolan J. Sykes, by the way, I asked people what they thought of Hyundai, and I was blown away by the positive responses. Without N, I don't think they'd be so positive. People whose opinions hold a lot of weight hit me up, saying that Hyundai is the most exciting, accessible brand at the moment. So, whatever they're doing, it's working. Thank you very much for watching Wheelhouse. Uh, I've been knee deep in Hyundai research over the past couple of weeks. Uh, it was pretty fascinating to learn about some of those cars, like the Scoop, I never heard of that one. Tiburon, it's all right if you have one of those. Good on you. If you've got a cool Hyundai, post some pics, tag me. Uh, I wanna see them. Like a month ago, we had a Kona N at the office. I took it out to the Crest. It was a great car. That DCT shifts super fast, and I was really impressed that a little crossover could be that fun to drive. Yeah, we'll see what happens from here. You know, more fun cars in the market is always a good thing. All right, see you next time. Be kind, bye.